How's it going guys? We have a medium difficulty question for family medicine, internal medicine, surgery for TCK. If you're studying for step one, I'll tell you some high level points you need to know. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. I really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-A-H-L man underscore medical. Links down below. Find me on Telegram. Links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. And I'll start the clip. 59-year-old man, three month history burning his throat. That's worse after meals. He has type 2 diabetes, mellitus, managed with insulin, HbA1c 12%. Physical exam shows diminished sensation of the lower extremities. Question wants to know the next step of management. So diagnosis of diabetes mellitus is going to be HbA1c greater than 6.5%. Any two fasting glucose is greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter any one random glucose greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter now clearly hba1c super fucking elevated it's to my observation across two ck and bme questions that if they want poor glycemic control to be the focus of the question they'll say hba1c is in the nines or greater obviously we want under 6.5 but plenty of questions will give it to you in the sevens, and it's not the focus of the question, okay? So when you see the 12 here, anything in the nines or greater, we say, oh, wow, okay, that's like shitty glycemic control with our peripheral neuropathy or in a patient who has GERD-like presentation. So let's just whip the answer here, next piece of management. Should I say, two-week trial of omeprazole, PPI, wrong fucking answer, albeit exceedingly high yield as the first step in diagnosis for regular GERD, quote-unquote. So if we had a 59-year-old male who they don't mention anything about diabetes and there's just three-month history of burning his throat after meals, okay, that just sounds like regular gastroesophageal reflux and we would do a two-week trial of the PPI to diagnose. If the symptoms are mitigated, then that's consistent with the diagnosis. There's one fucking question on one of the surgery forms where they do a two-week trial of an H2 blocker as the next best step management. They don't list the PPI as the answer. So you should be aware that PPI ideally is how we diagnose, and it's also more efficacious as the treatment. Choose it over the H2 blocker if you see both listed. And there's one fucking question where they have H2 blocker listed where PPI isn't. Now, for 2CK, if you do the two-week trial of PPI and symptoms are not mitigated, but we still strongly suspect GERD, patient can have more uh, difficult findings, presentations such as nocturnal cough, that's high yield for GERD, or sometimes pneumonitis, due to aspiration of gastric contents, especially while sleeping. Then you can do a 24-hour pH monitor as the next best step. In this case, wrong fucking answer. Choice B, erythromycin, wrong answer. So you need to know, although that this is a 50S ribosomal sub-inhibitor, protein synthesis inhibitor, antibiotic, okay, many uh, use cases, long discussion for erythromycin, you should know that for whatever fucking reason, it can also agonize motilin receptors within the GI tract and stimulate peristalsis. So it can be used in theory as a treatment for diabetic gastroparesis. You can know that as a factoid. I have not seen that formally assessed, okay, on any NBME content. It's just, as I said, in theory, something you can be aware of that erythromycin is capable of doing, but I haven't seen it assessed. Wrong fucking answer. Choice C, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, aka just regular upper endoscopy, is the correct answer, okay? So this is what you need to know. If you get a patient who has severe diabetes, they can give you HbA1c super high, peripheral neuropathy. They can say that you have a neurogenic bladder, okay, super pubic mass, and the patient has GI disturbance, okay, a GERD-like presentation in diabetes, you need to say, okay, that's not regular GERD, that's diabetic osteoporosis. First step in management is going to be an upper endoscopy to rule out physical obstruction. If they tell you in the last line of the question, upper endoscopy is performed, shows no abnormalities, the next best step is going to be gastric emptying scintigraphy, aka scintigraphic gastric emptying assay, which is a radio labeled substance they can put in food and then they measure how long it takes to empty in the stomach from the stomach through the pylorus etc and that will diagnose diabetic gastroparesis now if you do the upper endoscopy slash the gastric emptying scintigraphy and we have the uh, diagnosis confirmed of ga diabetic gastroparesis the next best step is going to be metoclopramide 
Okay, so metoclopramide is a prokinetic, which means it stimulates peristalsis. Also an antiemetic, prevents vomiting, which makes sense. If you push contents through, you're going to prevent it from going back up. It's a D2 receptor antagonist, but also has antagonistic effects at serotonin 5-HT3, agonistic effects at serotonin 5-HT4, most serotonin receptors in the GI tract. And it's the effects on serotonin receptors that are actually most responsible for its prokinetic effect. So this is what we would do first is the treatment, not the PPI. Now, I almost turned this into a straight up farm question. I decided to make this more 2CK focused, but if they give you the same fucking two liner question here, they say, what's the most appropriate pharmacologic therapy for this patient? PPI is wrong fucking answer. It'd be metoclopramide. Okay, so we classically would do metoclopramide first before erythromycin. I told you I haven't seen erythromycin formally assessed, but they want you to know metoclopramide used is used for diabetic gastroparesis. Now, I said I'd also give you some step one uh, related content here that is very high yield. You need to know that they just want motility disorder in quotes as the cause of the uh, pathology here. Okay, so they can have uh, malabsorption, they can have osmosis, they can have different types of answers when they give you a diabetic gastroparesis question, and they just want motility disorder, not hard, okay, but I just mentioned it because it's on the step one forms. You also need to know that if you get severe diabetes and they give you diarrhea and they say what's most likely to be affected, you need to know that's diabetic uh, neuropathy to the hypogastric nerves, sympathetic nerves of the GI tract. So the sympathetic nerves, hypogastric, are anti-peristalsis. So if you knock those out, you're going to have too much peristalsis and you get diarrhea. If, in contrast, they give you severe diabetes with severe constipation, you need to know that's diabetic neuropathy to the pelvic splanchnic nerves, the parasympathetic nerves to the GI tract. So if you knock out the peristalsis, now you're going to have constipation, unopposed hypogastric. So your short point of consolidation, apart from that brief anatomy right there, is that if you get a question on U.S. Simile where it sounds like GERD, but... They give you severe diabetes. You need to know that's diabetic gastroparesis. Upper endoscopy first to rule out physical obstruction. Then you're going to do a gastric emptying scintigraphy. Then for treatment, you're going to do metoclopramide first, not PPI. And then in theory, erythromycin can also agonize modal interceptors after a metoclopramide is used. You know the deal. Make sure you make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe my channel. And I appreciate your time. That's it.